Welcome everybody to our 2020 New Mexico House District 45 Candidates Climate Forum. My name is Seneca Johnson and I'm a leader with Yucca Action, the host for today's forum. I'm a proud member of the graduating class of 2020 and I'll be attending Yale University in the fall. I'm very excited to be a first time voter in this upcoming election and I also live in District 45. Hi, I'm Yang. I am from the Dine Nations and another leader of Yucca Action. I am a proud member of the 2020 graduating class. I am going to Fort Lewis in the spring. I am excited to be a first time voter in this year's election. And I'm Artemisio Romero E. Carver. I'm an incoming senior at the New Mexico School for the Arts. On behalf of the whole Yucca Steering Committee, thank you so much for being here. As you might know, Yucca stands for Youth United for Climate Crisis Action where young people from communities throughout northern New Mexico who are protecting our communities and our futures by demanding urgent action on the climate crisis. One important aspect of that is holding elected officials accountable. The work starts with being actively involved in elections. Yucca Action is our C4 that we launched earlier this year. We published a climate voters guide this week and today are hosting candidate forms for two key New Mexico House District races and District 3 congressional race. Please check out our voters guide before you cast your ballots. You can find it and these forms to share as well as our PRC forum on our website, www.yuccaaction.org, Y-U-C-C-A-C-T-I-O-N.org. We are extremely excited that you all are joining us and we're very grateful to our candidates for taking this time in the last leg of their campaign to consider important questions about the climate crisis and share with voters what they plan to do. The COVID-19 crisis has presented great challenges for our communities and our economy. It has also meant unthinkable tragedies for those who have lost um, loved ones and who are still grieving. We know that in the midst of all this, um, our communities are struggling to engage in political decision-making processes and the upcoming elections. But it's all the more critical that we stay engaged and ensure that decisions about relief spending, budget cuts, and planning for recovery and transition include the voices of our community and center the needs and vision for those most directly impacted. This is why Yucca, in the midst of our mutual aid efforts is making sure to take time to help our community members stay engaged in the election. As you know, the 2020 election was already going to be a definite moment for our climate movement. With the mandate from the world's leading scientists, emissions must be reversed by 2030. We know we have absolutely no time to spare. And even as the world is still reeling from the COVID-19 pandemic, the weather is warming up and we are faced with the threat of drought, wildfires, heavy waves, heat waves, and hurricanes that will put even more people's safety and well-being at risk. We have an enormous opportunity and responsibility to rethink the way our economy is structured, how resources are distributed, and how we care for one another and the earth. We need to rise the occasion and we need bold leadership that represents the voices of the will of our people. Because we are young people in Northern New Mexico, we have chosen races in our community to put the spotlight on. This forum features three of the six House District 45 candidates for our New Mexico State Legislature. District 45 is large and spans different parts of Santa Fe, from the South Side to the Santa Fe High School area. Chances are, if you attend or live near Capitol High or Tees, Sweeney, or Santa Fe High School, you might be in HD or House District 45. The current House District 45 representative is Jim Trujillo. After two decades of service, he's retiring and he is not running for re-election. Voters in House District 45 have the opportunity to elect new representation. The three candidates who responded to both our questionnaire and forum are Linda Serrato, Patrick Valera, and Carmichael Dominguez. We are honored to have them here and grateful that they took the time to share their visions and plans to transition our state economy and how they would work to protect our communities and the environment if elected. Each candidate was given two minutes to respond to each question. So without further ado, let's... 2020 is a critical election year. What motivated you to run for office? What is the vision that motivates you and what changes are you hoping to make? My main motivation to run for this office was I got many requests from the constituents in this area uh, when they found out that uh, Representative Jim Trujillo was retiring. So uh, I got many letters, I got many phone calls and text messages to ask to run for this office. And I thought about it for a while and I thought, you know, I, I can do it. I've been doing um, great public service work for the past eight years being your treasurer. 
And uh, now I'm going to give it a shot at working um, to help other people evolve. Uh, some of the main changes that I want to do is uh, eliminate the taxation on uh, Social Security benefits. I think uh, we can get the money more liquid if we uh, just let the, the people that get those benefits um, be able to use them as GRTs. And the GRTs, if, as you know, are distributed two months later. So, for instance, now we're in May. We would get those GRTs in July from the people that spend in in, uh, in May, so that's one of the main things I want to focus on. And the other thing I want to focus on is um, uh, retiree healthcare and healthcare in general. We the healthcare system is broken and it needs to be fixed. Uh, this, the medication as well, it, it, they skyrocketed, and uh, we the people are the ones that are suffering from it. Uh, so we need to do something by either looking at other states and getting ideas off of them to pull something together to make it work or uh, just reformat the whole system in general. Uh, can one person do that alone? Can one representative or senator do it alone? No. Uh, you would have to get buy-in from other uh, either senators or legislators. So uh, one of my main focuses would be to lobby each uh, of the peers to make sure that they can buy in to get these ideas fulfilled in so they can pass each individual committee and finally go to both houses and pass. Hopefully, fingers crossed. My motivation for running this year is my daughter, Alma. Um, my family believes that each generation should do better by the next. And so my grandparents came to this country. I'm third generation American. Um, they didn't know the language. They left behind their families and an entire life they knew. And they made a stable home for their kids that was sacrifice. Um, my parents, my dad worked 40 years at post office because it was a union job We had healthcare. And there were days that he didn't like working there, but he did it because he sacrificed for us so that we could be the first generation to graduate from college. Um, so each generation does better by the next. And I, I believe that's that outside of interviewing with you, I just believe that's what you need to do. So I need to make sure that I'm doing everything I can for my daughter Alma and for your generation, because you deserve that. Um, my vision really is to make sure that our working families are represented in the roundhouse. Um, as you probably know, there aren't a lot of working parents that are in the roundhouse right now. It's, it's hard. It's unpaid. Um, it's it's part time. So it's hard to keep your job, you know, amidst working there. And I believe that we need to make sure that our families have a voice um, when we're putting together a budget, when we're looking at um, the future of our, our state. Um, right now, families have a false choice between, you know, a good education and the oil industry that funds our education. That's not fair. And that system doesn't work for our families. Our kids deserve a good education and a sustainable future. And we need to work towards those goals. Um, we need to make sure that working families have access to, to things like paid sick, paid family leave, um, you know, uh, fair scheduling and a living wage outside of a pandemic because working families have emergencies every day and they deserve those the access to that. Seniors deserve an end to the Social Security tax because it's a double tax on their income. And, it may, and, and by taking it away, you inject more money into our economy, which we desperately need right now. So I just believe that we need to make sure that uh, working family voices are represented in the legislature. So 2020 is a critical election year and our country is in an urgent crisis right now. We have an administration that has no regard for the rule of law and has no regard for the Constitution. I have had uh, a couple of years to kind of experience that. And uh, I've been retired for a couple of years. And so I've also had the opportunity to kind of reflect on what's important to me. And of course, safety and security of your family is paramount. But I've also come to realize that one of the things that I really enjoy is public service and really doing the public good. Uh, with the experience and the relationships that I have, I understand that uh, being boisterous and loud is not the way to get things done. I'm not that kind of person in the first place. But really it comes down to really wanting to work on behalf of the people. Not only working for the people, but working with the people. Who is your constituency? So who is District 45? I, I really, really love this question because 
um, I know it really well. I like to say that District 45 really represents the hardworking people of this nation, of this state, and of this community. They, uh, District 45 is a very diverse community. It has subdivisions that were built in the late 60s and subdivisions that are brand new, essentially. Uh, we have two of the most dense subdivisions in the community, the Del Bellama subdivision and the Tierra Contenta subdivision. District 45 has the youngest population in our community. It rep represents the highest minority population in this community. It also represents the highest amount of poverty in this community. Uh, with that, from one side of District 45 to the other side of District 45, there is a $33,000 median income gap. And so that's something that I've been able to recognize over the years. Um, and lastly, uh, District 45 contains some of the largest public schools in our community. It's a community that needs better transportation, but better public transportation, better access to health care, and uh, better education. So I'm running for House District 45, which stretches from where Zia meets St. Francis down to where Zia becomes Rodeo, and then Rodeo becomes Airport Road, and then cuts off at 599, and then south of that to the freeway. And so that area has a lot of working class families in it. Um, and you know, when before social distancing, we knocked over a thousand doors. Since then, we've been doing a number of phone calls. But when I knock on doors, the, the two things that really struck out struck me was that um, you know one. We're intergenerational, uh, beautifully. Uh, our grandparents aren't just setting an example for the next generation, they're actively helping us take care of our kids. They're actively making sure that, you know, you know, the next generation has what they need. And so, you know, when I talk about family issues, it includes our abuelos and abuelitas. Um, they're directly impacted and they're part of our families. Um, and then two, we have what I call working class progressive values. Um, this seat does not belong to someone that is gonna be um, you know, still deciding once they get there what their views on climate change are. This isn't a seat that someone should, um, you know, enter and not be beholden to the people and beholden to a better education for our kids and just good progressive values. The, these, this is somebody that, that can take those hard stances and also help, you know, uh, get others on board as well. But it has to be working class. And the reason why I say that is that we need issues that are going to help our families today um, and including the families of the future. So we need to make sure that our, our, our families are taken care of now by ending the social security tax or uh, making sure we have paid sick leave, things that our families need today. Uh, we need to get in place as soon as possible. My constituency is really the blue collar area of town. This uh, District 45 has a lot of uh, government workers, uh, school workers, educators, uh, city workers, uh, county workers, and uh, small business owners. And um, these are the ones that are really the backbone of Santa Fe. So their uh, voices need to be heard and um, we need to get their ideas to take them up to up to the governor, you know, and see if what needs to be passed, what what they feel is needed, what they feel is not needed, what they need and what they do not need. Uh, that's the most important part is listening to the people themselves. What policy changes would you make to protect our communities from the climate crisis and prevent ecological collapse? The climate crisis is, uh, as you know, is in dire need. Um, I think being sheltered in place now for the past couple of months has helped a little bit, but obviously there's a lot of work to do. And I think everybody knows that we have been uh, um, relying on um, gas and oil for many, many years. And we need to wean ourselves off of that, especially down in the um, south, uh, eastern corner of our state. I think that there's better ways that we can get money instead of using uh, oil and gas or even fracking, uh, I believe that we can use alternative energy companies such as solar, wind, or geothermal companies to come into New Mexico, invite them in, and uh, uh, lease our lands. And that would have to be a joint uh, effort between our uh, land commissioner and, uh, of course, the legislators to see if we can get long-term lease agreements with these companies to come in uh if we don't act now we're not going to have a re anything for our future i i have a goddaughter that i worry about all the time to see if you know 
if she's going to be able to go out in the in the sun without being severely burnt just because the climate is so uh, damaged so um we need to act now and fast i think we believe we live in the most beautiful uh state in the nation and we need to preserve it uh we have beautiful skies we need to make sure that we preserve our trees and our our basic landscape because i think like i said we have the most beautiful landscape if we don't act now um we we're going to really ruin it for our future i think another thing we can also do is rely on uh uh, green bonds, these are new bonds that are actually shovel ready for uh, making um, green projects move forward. Uh, this would have to be a, a, a statute adjustment in uh, NMSA 6-10-10, but I, it would be a really good part and a really good effort for us New Mexicans to move towards that goal. So when it comes to policy changes, let me first start by Wrecking some of the, recognizing some of the things that have been done that I support. And then I'll get into some of the things that I would like to see happen. Number one, I'm really glad that Governor Michelle Lujan Grisham signed the executive order that made sure that New Mexico was part of the U.S. Climate Alliance. I support the 2015 Paris Climate Accord, and I support the Green New Deal. And as we know, the Green New Deal is intended to avoid planetary destruction. Um, what I think that we need to do is we need to create a just transition fund. And we need to make sure that that fund is uh, fully staffed and that it is fully funded. Uh, we're not going to be able to do the work that we need to do unless uh, something like that is fully staffed and fully funded. Um, we need to continue to work on community solar. And I think that what the state needs to do, the state legislature needs to do, is they need to give tools to local government so that local government can continue to help work on creating community solar. I think those are the two, two of the things that are really important. Um, and really what it comes down to is that any policies that we can create that reduces our dependence on fossil fuel are policies that need to be taken seriously um, and we need to make sure that we do everything that we can to make those policies happen. So having worked on Capitol Hill on natural resources during the um, economic recovery from the last Great Recession we had, um, you know, I think I can say a lot that it's possible at this time that may, a lot of people may not think. Um, a lot of states that were that recovered a lot faster than we did um, applied ag aggressively towards getting federal grants to build out their infrastructure and attract new businesses. And that's what we should be doing in our state as well. We should be um, looking towards grants and investing in getting grants that in, in infrastructure, education, broadband, our environment, all those pieces we should be actively looking to those solutions and building out that infrastructure means a lot so i mean we already have one of the best um you know wind uh schools in tucum carry that teaches how folks how to be employees how to be green technology employees um and how to train in these specialized fields we need to expand that significantly we already have some electric grids we need to expand those significantly um you know we have innovative ideas that community um uh, solar that you know is on the table we need to expand it significantly we have more sunny days here than most states we need and by study we need to be taking advantage of those pieces I do believe that the Energy uh, Transition Act, the ETA, was a really progressive piece of legislation and it's the most bold step forward, especially in a state like ours that doesn't have a lot of that infrastructure. There are two big uh, issues that brought me to pause. One was that we didn't do enough outreach to the Diné community about the, to get their input, but then two, that we didn't put enough protections along the way that upheld the values along the way to get there. So I think, you know, rolling back and looking back at natural gas again is, is a mistake. I think we need to be building our economy for the long run and not just for the short term gains that we're seeing from oil and gas. The last thing I'll say is that we need to make sure we have a state protection office against any rollbacks that are happening at the, at the DC level um, with the EPA. Our state should be able to protect ourselves when they're rolling back issues and, 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 and rolling back protections and regulations for their own you know, benefits and making sure that our people and our communities and our land and our natural resources are protected. Clovis is five years running out of water, five years. We need to take care of that issue now. Our current economic system relies on the creation of sacrifice zones, communities in our state that have had to bear the brunt of health and environmental costs of the extractive industry that is funding our state budget. 
These communities have been largely been indigenous and other marginalized communities. What will you do to put an end to environmental racism? Thank you for bringing up environmental racism. I think it's a really important issue and two minutes is not enough time to cover it. Um, right here in this district, there is toxic waste that is buried just 500 feet from a local school and very close to a local park off of Airport Road. And that's the kind of issue that you will see off of Airport Road that doesn't happen off of Canyon Road, uh, partially because our population may be lower income, may not speak English, and, um, and, it, and, and these issues center in these communities. And so that toxic waste was not disposed of properly. Um, there have been letters that have been written but no real solutions been taken. And so we need to, we need to really invest in getting that taken out um, so that our communities are protected. Um, similarly, we've been offering a false choice to uh, Native American communities, especially specifically the Diné community. For the past 50 years, we have uh, only provided, the only industry available in, near um, the Navajo Nation has been energy. And that means uh, uranium mining, and it means oil and gas. And uranium mining, we did not tell them how dangerous it was to wash your yellow cake covered clothes with your family's clothes, and that you were exposing your kids to dangerous chemicals, or I'm sorry, dangerous radiation. Um, we need to make sure that we are giving them more economic options than just the current economic short-term solutions that oil and gas provide today um, that, that have resulted in the largest methane cloud in the entire country. And so if we're doing that, if we're really investing in, in broadband, infrastructure, education, we're bringing new industries to the Northwest because there's a lot the Northwest offers, we can really see real change. Also, we need to meet people where they're at. Uh, when, when I became the organizer for the Families Belong Together vigil, um, the woman who had been running it before had said, I can't reach any of the immigrant groups. I would include them in this important thing, but I can't reach them because she tried to call them. But the thing about different communities, and I've worked across the north, north, northern part of the state, like they all communicate differently. And so we need to meet them where they're at. Um, you know, working parents don't have time. Can, is there some way that we can work with schools to dis disperse information? Is there some way we can work with, with different people? We need to talk with groups like um, Nuestra Tierra and others on how we can improve that together. Um, this is going to be hard, but what needs to be done again, um, perfect example of this is the waste isolation uh, pilot project plant uh, or WIP, as we know. Uh, our voices were never heard on the concerns of what could happen if one of these uh, trucks would uh, have an accident on the highway. Uh, there was many, many concerns about it, and I don't know if, if you, everybody knows their New Mexico history well, but uh, many voices were heard, protests were done, but they still went to head on with a project. Uh, yes, there is waste, but I don't think it was needed to be in our back door. And that's really frustrating um, for me as a New Mexican, that everything is always gets pushed towards, you know, the low areas or the low income parts of, of, uh, of the state. Uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, look at uh, Chernobyl, for instance, that be almost became a worldwide matter. Well, it did was a worldwide matter, but it was almost a whole worldwide disaster. Um, I think the best way to approach this is have more uh, enforcement teams out there and uh, budget for those enforcement teams to be watching, uh, be a watchdog for uh, these um, either nuclear or other kind of waste um, containment areas. Um, those are the probably the most uh, deadliest that that are, that exist, and I know people are still um, suffering from even the uh, Trinity tests. So uh, that's how I would probably implement this. Uh, implement this is making a plan to um, um, budget for a watchdog group to be um, watching these and uh, citing these uh, companies that uh, do these harms. Uh, this is a really good question. Uh, we talk about uh, social justice, environmental justice, and environmental racism. W what I'd like to say is that before we address the, those things, we need to understand what they are. Uh, environmental racism is a disproportionate impact of the environmental hazards on people of color. So what that means is that we know that three out of every five African Americans live in a community that has toxic waste. Um, we also know that our indigenous community is subject to higher rates of obesity and higher rates of uh, sugar diabetes. 
And so those are just two examples of what uh, environmental racism is. Um, that's why I worked on the airport road overlay here in Santa Fe, because I recognized those things. I used that information to my advantage. And it was really about creating a better quality of life for the people in that part of our community. Uh, we need to work with grassroots organizations uh, so that we can teach others about what environmental racism is. We need to empower communities so that they can do the work that needs to be done to address, address things like environmental racism. What are your plans to transition our economy off of fossil fuels in the timeline scientists have given us? Can you publicly pledge to support the creation of a just transition study and fund to identify alternative revenue sources for our state budget and invest in community driven climate mitigation and ad adaptation strategies? Um, we not only as a state, but as a nation are way behind the ball on this. Uh, we were supposed to be in compliance since um, I think 2022 was when we were supposed to be reducing the combustible engine, but we're still uh, still using the combustible engine while other countries are, are relying more on electrical cars. Um, I used to work at DOT and I was given a model to look at where to put charge stations around uh, the state, around, around along the interstates, along all the interstate corridors. Uh, this was back in 2009, mind, mind you, and uh, nothing has been done since. Um, so that's just where we're at. We seem to be stuck, and I'm not sure exactly if it's the big four um, car manufacturers or what's holding up everything, but we need to we really uh, wean ourselves off fossil fuels uh, pretty quick. There's already al alternative um uh, ways of um, producing energy, like for uh, homes, uh, we don't need to be constantly digging for oil or, or for gas, natural gas. There's other ways to heat your homes nowadays. Uh, I think we can rely more on those than uh, fossil fuels. And um, that's one of the main um, things that I w always wanted to work on. Uh, even before I was, you know, running for a legislative spot, I was trying to do my best as a treasurer to see what I could do to um, um, minimize that. But there's, of course, there's nothing that the treasurer could do because those duties are pretty much statutory. Um, but I would uh, pledge and support a creation to uh, to do a study to um, fund uh, and identify alternative revenue sources for the state for, for, um, for sure on that. Um, it needs to be done. If we don't do something, we're, we're going to be uh, sorry about it later. And uh, it needs to be done now. Uh, this is uh, another good question and kind of speaks to uh, the heart of why we're having the debates that we're having and the discussions that we're having on the environment. Um, <laughs> I think it's first and foremost, we need to Accept the fact that we are in the midst of a climate crisis. We need to accept that fact. We need to understand that it is a reality. We need to stop denying that fact. And we need to stop denying the impact, the negative impact that we're having on our climate and on our environment. Uh, that's why I've supported every effort as a city councilor to reduce our carbon footprint. I think it's important that we do everything that we can to reduce that carbon footprint. And that's why I also spearheaded efforts to amend our green building code in an effort to continue to reduce our carbon footprint for future generations. I think that we need to continue to work towards those outcomes, but I think education is the key. Uh, fossil fuel, the fossil fuel era is ending and we need to do what we can to generate a green economy. Uh, we need to be able to generate high paying jobs. We have an abundance of solar. We have an abundance of wind in our, in our state. And in order to be able to utilize those alter alternative sources of energy, 
we're going to have to make sure that we have folks that are going to be able to service that industry. Um, and so it's an opportunity to create high paying jobs, good, clean paying jobs um, in the state of New Mexico. So I think your question hits, hits it right on the head. I think we need to transition our economy away from fossil fuels. Uh, my campaign doesn't take any money from oil or gas um, on purpose because I think that it presents um, a bias in legislatures and I don't think that's right. Um, and so, you know, as a result, there's so many solutions we can take to make sure that our energy solutions are, are locally based, but also sustainable. Um, so I believe that you're right with a just transition study and fund. Um, I believe that's important um, to have, a, you know, to begin to really research what economic development can we be creating that is fair to all communities, but also make sure that um, that you know helps helps build all communities, but also make sure that we're we're investing towards the future. Um, I believe there's a ton that we can do to attract new industries to our state, and it goes back to the things I've talked about multiple times: investment in infrastructure, education, and broadband. St Companies love our state. We're beautiful. I mean, it's it's the same reason we love our state. It's 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 you know phenomenally diverse. We have so much going on here. Um, but what it lacks is investment in the things that people need. Um, you know, schools, broadband. What makes a business work, and what makes our families thrive. So we need to make sure we're investing in those pieces to attract new industries. I also think that um, you know we have to look at the tax cuts we've given to people in the past. The past two governors were able to significantly cut taxes for the wealthiest in the state and corporations, and leaving a lot of the bill to be paid by middle class New Mexicans like like myself and like I'm sure many of you, um, and and pieces like the Social Security double tax, which came in when there was a shortfall, and that was uh, you know a, a, at the time I think it was a seventy million dollar shortfall. I can't remember the exact number, but it fit exactly that hold of. To, to, to fix. And so instead of looking to increase taxes for the top earners, we instead rely on our middle income seniors to for the brunt of it. We have to stop that thinking and we really have to make sure that everyone is paying their fair share. Um, given its recent collapse, describe the role or lack of role that you believe the oil industry should have in New Mexico's future as a state. So I think it's really good that you bring up the volatile nature of the oil industry. And I think it's important to look at the calendar that we had this year. At the end of February, um, the state legislature passed one of the most progressive um, budgets we've ever had that really invests in education and invests in our teachers and the future of our state. And that was awesome. And while the governor is signing bills, she has to stop because the, oil, the price of oil has just plummeted and it continues to plummet onward in four weeks. Four weeks, we saw our budget completely decimated because of how volatile the oil industry is. And that's that's aside from COVID, that was happening in, tand in tangent to it, but it wasn't uh, in tandem to it. It was not uh, uh, because of. And so I think that 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 volatile nature means that we're not basing our budget on something you know secure and stable. We're basing it on a gamble. And you don't base your family's budget on a gamble. You base it on something real. And so we need to be doing more to attract businesses to our state through building infrastructure, broadband, and education. I'll keep saying it over and over again. Those investments are going to make a difference. And reducing the influence of oil and gas on our state legislature. I'm one of the only candidates um, running, I am the only candidate in this race to refuse oil and gas money outright because I believe it influences people's decisions and we need to take that out of the equation. Oil and gas money should all become the rainy day fund and we should be making sure that we're valuing them at the proper amount and that they're not underpaying how much they owe to the state. I think those are really important pieces because we have to end this false choice we're giving to families. It's not right that I have to choose for my daughter if I want her education to be well-funded but with a bad environment with, with a bad environmental future or a sustainable future in in a, in a an education that lacks funds that's not a choice that our parents should have to make we should be investing on things that make sense the last thing i'll say is that the last two governors were able to cut and significantly cut um uh, taxes for corporations and the top earners and we, we need to make sure that those groups are paying their fair share so for the future of new mexico uh i personally think that we should not be budgeting on something that has so much volatility in the market um i think this is bad practice i know we've been doing it and we've be, been relying on that source for for many years and um I, it's time to start looking at uh alternative sources like i mentioned earlier i think we can rely on a lot of our natural resources i we're blessed to have sun as uh, uh here in new mexico and wind and uh, geothermal that we can actually use those as uh, alternative funding sources. Um, again, I think we should get some kind of a group in a study to look at the alternative sources that we can rely on that are more constant that we can budget 
uh, or have a good firm budget year to year instead of relying on the same oil and gas revenue and and drilling and really messing up our own uh, our own landscape just to make a buck. Um, it really really bothers me that you know that our future um, may not have a great future by uh, us constantly destroying um, what's around us just to make our uh, budget uh, year over year. Well, I think the first thing is that the oil and gas industry needs to do what they said they would do, and that is clean up after themselves. Uh, they need to live up to the promises that they made to us and to you to clean up after the messes that they made. Uh, we need to fully fund the oil conservation division and give them the authority and the power that they need to assess penalties and fees and fines to those companies and those industries that, not, that do not do what they say they are going to do. We must demand that the industry clean up our wetlands, our watersheds, and our sacred sites. Our culture is one of the most important things that makes New Mexico so special. Our culture, our climate, our heritage, all of those things. And if they're ruined, then we're not going to be able to enjoy those things that makes uh, New Mexico so special. Climate crisis is an inherently multi-generational issue. As a politician, what legacy do you want to leave for us youth? And what do you believe your responsibility is to those who come after you? I would like to, for the youth uh, of today, to know that I've tried all my best that you've, to bring forth legislation to, you know, to prevent uh, the further destruction of our own uh, climate. Uh, as I said earlier, can one uh, legislature do this alone? No, that's, that's a lie. If somebody says they're going to do this and that, they need to get the buy-in from the other uh, legislators. Uh, and there has been pushback for many years in certain areas. Why? I don't know. I, it's probably money. money. Money talks. I don't know why it has to be a big factor, but uh, I wish everybody would come together and look and say, hey, you know, our environment is important to us. Our our state, our landscape is important for us and it's for our future. Instead of relying on the mighty dollar, um, that's the legacy I would like to leave, especially for like my god, I have a goddaughter and I have a godson and I would like them to know that I am trying for them for that they have a better uh, future to build on and for their kids uh, leave a, uh, a good stewardship for them. Uh, that's my goal, uh, and that's what I've been working on even in my current role, is leaving a good um, uh, role for them to see that they did something and I made an impact for them. And that's what I would like uh, to leave, is that kind of legacy. <laughs> on behalf of my generation, I want to profoundly apologize to the current generation and to future generations for not doing more to protect our environment. Uh, it's not really anything new, the stress that our environment is in. I remember hearing about it when I was young, but for whatever reason, whether it be ignorance or not caring, uh, not paying enough attention, we just did not do enough to take this issue seriously and have left things in worse condition um, than they've ever been for the f for future generations. Uh, but I am impressed with the energy and the power that young people have on this issue, not only in this community, but around the world. One of the reasons that I supported the plastic bag ban here in Santa Fe is because we had a group of young people that went in front of the city council, voiced their concern, asked us to create a policy and imp implement a policy that would reduce not only litter, but help save the environment by eliminating the use of plastic bags in our community. And so I'm very proud of that. And I think lastly, it's important that I do what I can to leave a positive legacy 
for the future generation. Um, at least to stay out of the way, to do what I can to um, build a foundation for which they can grow on to make things better than they are. So I started this conversation by talking about our legacy that we leave the next generation and how it's important to do better by the next generation. And I believe that really at my core, because that's what I've always been brought up to believe. But I'm not running for myself. I'm running because my daughter's future depends on it. And if she's not in a place where the world is secure, where there's concerns over our climate, um, where, where our, our animal populations are decimated, where um, you know our human populations are decimated, you know that's not the world that she deserves. She deserves something significantly better. So I am committed to working with the youth, to working with all these different folks that represent working families uh, to make sure that we're protecting our climate for the next generation. Um, you know, and having worked on natural resources, I understand the different poles here, but let's be very clear. Climate change is real. This isn't a question. It's about how to resolve it in a way that works for our families and stop putting corporations that have a lot of money and a lot of influence at the center of the conversation. The center of the conversation needs to be our families and how we can do more and better by them. So yeah, I believe that I will work my hardest to do right by the next generation. Now, please share your closing statement. Uh, so in closing, I want to once again thank you all for giving me the opportunity to participate in this process. I'm really proud of the organization for some of the things that I that they've been doing over a number of years in this community. Um, and so again, I'm just really uh, happy to have been able to participate in this process and to address you all. Um, Quite frankly, I'm, I'm pretty proud of the legislative and policymaking experience that I have uh, in the state of New Mexico. Um, I spent hours of time, hours and hours learning about myself, learning about our community, learning about organizations, learning about the economy, um, establishing relationships with organizations and other individuals, and working on policies like uh, free public transportation for our young people, um, creating spaces for our young people to be able to recreate, um, and increasing the children and youth fund by uh, close to a million dollars. Um, because the young people of our community, our future, it's important that we invest and that we do what we can to um, appreciate them. Uh, I know this community, I know this state, I don't come from a politically motivated family. None of my family members are politicians or ever, ever aspired to be politicians. Um, I'm not even sure why I became become a politician, other than to say that my family, uh, which is blue collar, appreciates hard work, always encouraged me to get involved in the community. Um, so if you want someone who has the experience as a policymaker, has the experience as a legislator, someone who knows the community, someone who is invested in this community, please consider me as your next representative for House seat in District 45. Thank you. So I just want to start by saying thank you to you. Um, this is an open seat. There are a lot of people running and the, yours is the only forum taking place. No one else has called us to do forums. So thank you for taking up the mantle and, and being that those leaders. Um, I know you didn't anticipate being that, but I appreciate it because it shows your dedication to these causes and that you're ready to tackle future um, uh, issues that come up. And I also think it sends a clear message to all of us candidates that whoever becomes the person that occupies this seat will have to contend with you and will have to answer to you because the decisions we make in the roundhouse directly impact your future. And so we need to take that very seriously. My daughter's life and future means the world to me. There is nothing I think about more often than how I can make a difference in her life. And I anticipate leading like her future depends on it. And that's your future too. So I hope, should I get elected, that I will live up to that standard. And I also will say this, should I be elected, this office will be an open door because it's important to hear from folks and what your experiences are. So that it's not just lobbyists that are making the decisions on behalf of everyone. I want you to bring studies. I want you to highlight stuff. I may not always have time to talk, but I want to see what you're looking at. So I understand what, what challenges you're looking at at the same time. 
My campaign has been endorsed by the Adelante Progressive Caucus, um, Sierra Club Rio Grande Chapter, uh, Conservation Voters New Mexico, Animal Protection Voters, um, New Mexico Youth Climate Strike, Working Families Party, um, Planned Parenthood Votes endorsed us, Olay, that's organizers in uh, the Land of Enchantment uh, has endorsed us, uh, the Firefighters Union has endorsed us, um, and AFT, the American Federation of Teachers, has endorsed us. Um, I say them quickly, but I don't take them lightly. All of those communities make New Mexico beautiful. And I want to make sure that you all have a voice in the legislature. So I, I appreciate the time. Thank you for led listening. Thank you for making this possible. Um, just keep up the good work. You guys, are, you guys are amazing. Thank you. In closing, I would like everybody to know that um, our climate is very important for us and it's very fragile. And I think a lot of people take it for granted. They don't really know how ruined it is and how our uh, older generations have ruined it for us and i think it was just the lack of knowledge of not knowing uh what to do with um waste and and uh relying a lot on oil um now i think um we just need to make sure that we make sure that it's very important for anybody as a legislature as a senator even congress to know that it needs to be acted on now and it seems like it makes some momentum and then there's some kind of uh, pushback but we need our voices need to be heard your voices need to be heard um and just keep on constantly getting with your local elected official and state your concerns uh a lot of a lot of other um elected officials might not know exactly what's going on with the environment because they're not in touch with it uh it's not that they're bad people it's maybe that they just don't know but i think the more that people are educated on the direction that the climate is currently in and the dangers that uh can happen if we don't pay attention is uh is vital so i think um groups like yourselves and other groups like such as the sierra club and others um should be heard and invited to um, to speak at any function at the legislature uh, in the rotunda. Uh, your voice is key. Uh, I've, I've always been told that the squeaky wheel always gets oil. We have to be the squeaky wheel, uh, so we get our what we need done done and uh, make sure that everybody knows the importance of uh, leaving a good. Um, environment for our future uh, thank you for your time thank you for listening to me i wish everybody well and make sure everybody stays home and if you're out wear a face mask thank you for your time thank you all so much for all of your responses and thank you to all of our viewers for tuning in and staying engaged early voting has started in new mexico and most absentee ballots have already been sent out to voters around the state before you fill out your ballot and send it to the county clerk or head to the polls on June 2nd, please check out our Climate Voters Guide at yuccaaction.org to learn more about where these and other candidates running for office in New Mexico stand on climate. We need to get out the vote. Join us for a series of phone bank events in the next two weeks leading up to the election. You can sign up at www.yuccaaction.org. Please join us for the next candidate forum today at 4 p.m. Thank you so much again to the candidates and to our viewers. Stay safe, everyone.